Hi, everyone. Welcome back to freepilotgroundschool.ca. This is our first lesson of flight operations. I'm hoping that you're still with me after completing air law. I know it's a slog to get through all of that stuff. No videos, no pictures, just text memorizing arcane rules. It is difficult. There's a way I do that, though. Uh, there's a reason that I do it like that. And the reason is, is if you can handle the most difficult part or the most boring part of your flight training first, well, then you're going to be able to get through the rest of it. The worst thing that I hate as an instructor, I get a student, they're doing really well, and then they decide to keep putting off uh, air law, P-star stuff, and then they get close to where they're flying by themselves as an instructor. I love it. And then they just kind of give up because they can't get through it. Then in the end, they've wasted a lot of their time. They've wasted my time and they wasted a lot of their money. So if you've got through this far, we're over the hump. And from now on, it might still be a little bit boring. Certainly not as much fun as actually flying the airplane, but at least now it's going to seem a lot more practical than what you saw in the past. So let's get started. Our first topic we're going to cover is the pilot and command responsibilities. And there's not much that I can say about this uh, topic other than give you a few guidelines and you have to use your common sense to come up with an appropriate answer. And a good chunk of your pre-solo test, your P-STAR test, focuses on pilot and command responsibilities, as does your private pilot license test. So to get started, the overarching theme is that the pilot in command is responsible, directly responsible for the safe operation of the aircraft. That's no one else's responsibility. It's never anyone else's responsibility, no matter what kind of airplane you fly. It is your responsibility as the pilot in command. You have the final authority for decisions related to safety. However, you are allowed to deviate from regulations in the interest of flight safety. And if any of you are lawyers or have any background in law, this is called a due diligence defense. Now I could probably talk for half an hour, a lawyer could probably talk about two hours, maybe even a day, all about what due diligence is and is not. But generally speaking, what due diligence means is that you made an attempt to follow the rules. However, a situation arose where the safest course of action, you've exhausted all legal courses of action and the safest course of action is by, let's just say, breaking the rule in the interest of flight safety. And in that case, you have the burden of proof if it ever comes to some sort of quasi-judicial quasi uh, tribunal to prove that. However, in all seriousness, if you ever have to deviate from, let's say, an air traffic control instruction or a clearance, nobody's even going to rake you over the coals about it. You just explain it immediately. I was unable to do this because this is the safest course of, this was the safest course of action. However, having discussed this due diligence defense, you cannot claim due diligence. You cannot break a rule because it is safe to do so because you broke another rule in the first place. So an example of this is you're flying in bad weather. You're below your VFR uh, weather minima. You're flying in, let's say, a mile visibility when it should be two miles visibility. The clouds are low. You really should have stayed on the ground and not go flying. But instead, what you do is fly really low over the farmer's house or over the over the city you can't then say oh i had to fly low because the weather was bad well yeah that's true but you shouldn't have been flying in that weather in the first place so hopefully this makes some sense to you we're going to get through uh at the end of this lesson when we get to the sample test questions we will discuss this and give you some examples of where this might come up and hopefully you can establish some sort of a pattern with how to apply these pilot and command responsibilities in real life. Let's talk about winter operations in effect uh, for a moment. Uh, where I live in Thunder Bay and where a lot of us live in, in, uh, in Canada, there is winter a good chunk of the time of the year and with winter comes ice and snow. Now we know from our air law and we will know, we will learn more about this that ice and snow is incompatible with flight. 
doesn't mean you're going to crash all the time, but it's very dangerous, it's illegal, and you should never fly with any amount of ice or snow on a critical surface, such as a wing or a tail or a propeller. To prevent the buildup of snow, if your airplane is outside, we should use wing covers. As you can see here, it's a Blanca Decathlon, I believe. It has full wing covers on. There's snow on the covers, but the great thing is you pull the covers off and the snow and ice generally comes with it. Sometimes uh, you will still find that the wing covers, there'll be, let's say, rain, freezing rain, it will soak through the wing covers and you pull the covers off, there's still ice but that is very rare. Uh, it's, it's rare that that will happen. So I would encourage you to use wing covers if your aircraft cannot be hangered. It's well worth your investment. Also, in the cold weather, you should use engine preheat, just like you would use on a diesel vehicle. Uh, airplanes don't like cold very much, or the engines don't like cold very much, and so you should use uh, have proper preheat installed. I'd be very wary of putting a preheat on that uses some sort of combustible uh, and blows into the engine. It is possible. However, in one case that I directly observed, a pilot put their heater on underneath the uh, cowling. It was very hot, it malfunctioned, it got too hot. What ended up happening is it got so hot that it boiled the oil inside of the shimmy damper on a nose gear. That oil then proceeded to make the oil, the uh, shimmy damper explode. The oil then caught fire and uh, there was almost an engine fire. It was only because a, another flight instructor saw this happening and she was able to run out with a fire extinguisher and extinguish the fire. It's also cabin heaters that you may want to be familiar with. If you want to uh, have any semblance of heat in your aircraft, you want winter survival equipment, should you go down. And you uh, don't want to assume that a runway is clear of snow. Let's say you're coming in to land somewhere and it's uh, it looks uh, snowy. Uh, you should be calling ahead of time and uh, getting a runway surface condition report if no NOTAM has been issued. The other risk that you may run in during winter operations is whiteout. And what whiteout is, is when you have an overcast sky and you have featureless snowy terrain, white terrain, white sky, you have now lost your horizon. And even though you may have good visibility, you've lost your horizon and it will look the same as flying in cloud and you could become disoriented. Now, these are only a few pertinent facts about a winter operations. There's a lot of information found in your flight uh, from the ground up, as well as the Aeronautical Information Manual, the AIM. I encourage you to read those in depth. And when you start flying in the winter, perhaps talk with a flight instructor or an experienced pilot that can uh, show you some, show you the ropes and show you uh, some of the pitfalls and how to avoid them. Let's talk about thunderstorms for a little bit. We'll learn more about thunderstorms and meteorology, what causes them and things like that, but you should know some of the flight operations aspects of thunderstorms. You do not want to fly through a thunderstorm or under a thunderstorm, including the anvil. You also do not want to take off into a thunderstorm because as we'll learn in meteorology, even though you are taking off into wind, you will find yourself in, uh, or you may find yourself in a considerable amount of decreasing performance wind shear. The general rule is that you want to stay at least five nautical miles away from a thunderstorm cell or anvil or 10 nautical miles if you are flying above the freezing level. So you are flying near a thunderstorm, but it is cold outside and you are above the freezing level. If you end up in a thunderstorm, you want to reduce your speed to the maneuvering speed and you want to fly straight through it. You do not want to subject the aircraft to additional G-forces. It's usually faster to just go through the cell, but you should have avoided that situation in the first place. Now I've dedicated just one slide to mountain flying, but I just want to make clear that in no way does one slide convey the complexity that's associated with flying in the mountains. There are entire textbooks written about how to fly in the mountains. One of my favorite by Sparky Imason called the Mountain Flying Bible. 
And despite Sparky Imason's extensive experience flying in the mountains and writing textbooks about flying in the mountains, conducting safety seminars about mountain flying, he ended up dying himself flying in the mountains. That's just unfortunately what happens in an unpredictable area. So I'd like to mention that mountain flying is a very unique skill set and it requires additional training and experience. If you have never flown in the mountains, it would be wise for you to go with a flight instructor and get a mountain flying checkout, maybe spend five or 10 hours flying in the mountains and getting used to that terrain. One of the difficulties about mountain flying is that the weather can rapidly change very quickly. It can go from a nice day to a miserable day and there are limited places to land. So let's compare this with flying in the prairies or where it's flat. If you're flying where it's flat, it's a thousand foot ceiling, that's pretty safe. You can fly at 500 feet. And as long as you stay at 500 feet, it's highly unlikely you're going to hit something. However, if it's a thousand foot ceiling in a mountain pass, it's very likely it will be fatal. There is no place for you to go. It's a good idea when you're flying, or I should mention that the sunny and upwind side of ridges have updrafts, the dark and downwind sides have downdrafts. Generally speaking, you wanna fly where there are updrafts. However, some people recommend you fly where there are downdrafts. In that case, if you need to turn around quickly, you are at least turning into rising air as opposed to being on the sunny side and I have to turn around and fly into downdrafts. If you need to cross a ridge, it's a good idea to approach that ridge at 45 degrees so that if you encounter a downdraft, you can turn around. Let's talk about collision avoidance. The primary principle in collision avoidance in aircraft is the see and avoid principle. It's your job to look out and it's your job to avoid other traffic. You want to ensure that you make proper radio calls on the proper frequency and if you do see an object on your windscreen and it's not moving, then it's most likely that you will collide with that object. If it's moving up or down or side to side, you will probably clear that object. You will be expected to know all about runway numbering on your private pilot license test and your P-STAR. Runway numbers are given in degrees magnetic to the nearest 10 in Southern domestic airspace and degrees true in Northern domestic airspace. So a runway that's situated at 220 degrees in Southern Domestic Airspace will be runway 22, and that 220 is degrees magnetic. Airports usually have what's called a rotating beacon. This is a light on the tower or on its own tower that rotates, usually white, and allows you to fly, find the aircraft or find the airport at night. Large aircraft often use what are called VASIs, Visual Approach Slope Indicator System, or the PAPI, the Precision Approach Path Indicator, to determine whether they're high or low on approach. If we look uh, the, at the PAPIs, usually they're aligned at three degrees, which is a normal approach path for a large aircraft. A PAPI is four lights, left uh, side by side. If they're all white, you're too high. If you're on slope, they are too white and too red. And then if, they, if you are too low, they're four red. The VASIs are three on top of one another. VASIs are less common now, and you want to see a red set of lights on top and a white set of lights below. Often obstructions are marked, although you shouldn't assume that they are. Towers are often have red lights and hydro lines in areas where helicopters or aircraft might be flying have balls put on them so that you can see the wires. However, if you are flying in an area where there might be uh, hydro wires, don't look for the wires. They're usually too thin to identify. Rather look for the towers and then obviously if there are towers, there are going to be wires associated. You want to obviously stay above or well above the height of the towers.
In aviation in North America, we use uh, nautical miles for a distance. Speed is in nautical miles per hour, also called knots. Temperature is given in degrees Celsius, and time is given in hours plus minutes, such as one plus 45 is obviously one hour, 45 minutes. I have to briefly discuss radio communications in flight operations. Although we have discussed it already in air law, and you have already covered it in your radio license study guide. When you are talking on the radio, you want to ensure that you are on the correct frequency. Also, there is a priority for what, how you're going to communicate while flying. You're going to aviate, navigate, and communicate. By that, I mean we fly the aircraft, make sure it's going where we want it to go, the right direction. After that, we navigate, we make sure that we're going uh, to the correct place where we want to go, and then we communicate. We let air traffic control uh, know what we're doing. Don't let a call by ATC force you into a situation where you're no longer flying the aircraft or you don't know where you're going. Wait to communicate until after you've aviated and navigated, and then you can call air traffic control back. Sometimes pilots land nose down first. This puts a lot of stress on the nose gear and the firewall and could result in a nose gear collapse. This occurs when there's too much weight on the nose gear and this is called wheelbarrowing. What happens when you wheelbarrow is you lose directional control and braking, not to mention you may overstress the nose gear. There are three different types of hydroplaning. Hydroplaning involves a tire moving over a wet surface and no longer has sufficient friction. During hydroplaning, the tire squeezes water under the thread, which causes pressure that can lift portions of the tire off of the runway and reduce friction. The most common in areas that get a lot of rain is dynamic hydroplaning, where a thick layer of water creates a wedge or a wave ahead of the wheel, preventing it from making contact with the ground. The next type is viscous hydroplaning, which occurs in a thin layer of water. Lastly, reverted rubber hydroplaning occurs when the tire, the brakes are locked up on a wet surface. This heats up the water, creating steam, preventing the tire from making contact with the surface. Let's talk quickly about taxiing the aircraft. You'll learn more about this in one of your early flight lessons, how to taxi the aircraft properly on the ground. Generally speaking though, each, the speed that you want to taxi is dependent on the circumstances. On a long taxiway, it's usually safe to travel bicycle speed. Let's say 15 kilometers per hour, be about five or 10 knots. On the ramp, you wanna be at walking speed let's just say five knots, and on a congested ramp, half walking speed, one or two knots. Often aircraft damage occurs on the ground when the pilot isn't paying attention. For this reason, it is imperative that even though you are on the ground, you are giving the task at hand its full attention and are not taxiing where you shouldn't be taxiing. As you can see in this picture, two pilots looks like they may not have been paying attention, end up taxing into one another. This can be obviously dangerous and cause damage to the aircraft. And last but not least, it's probably pretty embarrassing when you have to go and explain to the aircraft owner or the flying school or your buddies why you ended up in the side of an aircraft. Here's another nice little picture of uh, what looks to be an Airbus A340. They taxied probably on a taxiway that was meant for small aircraft and instead of making it safely to their runway, they ended up with the wing hitting a building. It's pretty embarrassing. Here's a funny video of what happens when the ramp is contaminated with ice, so there's no friction and the wind is very strong. I'm gonna show you this video now, and I'd like you to watch this guy right here very carefully.
no crap. Oh shoot. That's crazy. <laughs> he's, he's trying to push it back in place. Oh crap. Right? 
Out the first time that's a new It's a new movie, Dumb and Dumber.
So that was pretty funny. I'm not really sure why the music had to come in. Whoever made the video had to put some, I don't know, 80s uh, arena rock in there. But it's a pretty funny video to see that guy trying to push that airplane back into position. Uh, if a 100,000 or 150,000 pound airplane is getting moved by the wind, I don't think a 200 pound man is going to help the situation by pushing on it at all. Talk about some more about uh, the effects of wind and wind shear. A wind shear is a change in velocity with altitude. A lot of people think that wind shear is kind of the same as gusty conditions, and uh, no, it is not. And sometimes you'll hear at an airport, some Cessna 172 will report wind shear. Uh, it's probably just because it's gusty. So we can have wind shear that is increased performance or decreasing performance. So let's say this aircraft is coming into land. The, there is a tailwind, and now it flies into a headwind. The airspeed will increase, so that's called increasing performance shear. And because the airspeed increases, the aircraft will likely rise above the glide slope. Conversely, the reverse can happen. You could be flying from a headwind into a tailwind. You will have decreased performance shear, and you will tend to slow down and therefore undershoot the runway. Both can be quite dangerous. Both are usually associated with thunderstorms or low level jet streams. A side slip is the intentional cross control intended to increase drag or maintain a center line. Often side slips uh, are, is a kind of a catch all term, but even though it can be broken up into three different similar maneuvers. One is the forward slip, which is used to decrease or increase the rate of descent. The side slip is technically used to maintain a runway center line. And last, we have a slipping turn, which is a side slip in a turn to increase the rate of descent. We'll learn more about side slips in one of your in-flight lessons where you'll be uh, doing it yourself. Let's review. The pilot command is responsible for everything. They can make exceptions for the purpose of flight safety. The Minister of Transport can provide exceptions to the cars, but this is very rare. Mountains and thunderstorms have lots of risks. Runway numbers are magnetic in southern domestic airspace and true in northern domestic airspace. Hydroplaning occurs on wet runways. We have three types. Dynamic, a wall of water ahead of the wheel. Viscous is a thin layer of water. And reverted rubber is burning rubber or steam preventing contact with the surface of the runway. Let's talk about some sample questions. So a lot of these questions relate to pilot command responsibilities. And as I discussed with you earlier, there are no set rules. I did not cover this exact material early on, but I did cover some principles that you should know. And you can use these principles to make a pretty good guess what would be the right answer. So let's talk about this. If cleared for takeoff immediately following the very low approach and overshoot of a large aircraft, the pilot should. So keep in mind from earlier lessons, we talked about weight turbulence, so you might not want to take off. So take off immediately, otherwise the trailing vortices will descend into the flight path. Well, that's not correct. You don't want to be doing something where there's a risk that you're going to hit wingtip vortices. B, taxi position on the runway, until it is considered safe to take off. So if we think back and apply some common sense, assuming we have a takeoff clearance, ATC expects us to take off right away. C, decline the takeoff clearance and inform ATC of the reason for non-acceptance. So that is going to be the correct answer. If we do something, ATC tells us to do something, it's not safe to do so, we decline and we advise ATC. The last one, E, wait for two minutes after the large aircraft has passed, then take off. Well, that's kind of right as well, but we do want to let ATC know. The controller suggests to take off from a runway intersection. The pilot must be aware that A, the remaining runway length will not be stated by the controller. It's actually not true. The controller will tell you the runway length, although that's their 
responsibility and not yours. B, it is pilot's responsibility to ensure that the remaining runway length is sufficient for takeoff. So remember, rule number one, pilot command responsibilities, everything is the pilot command responsibility. So B is most likely the correct answer. Let's look at the C. The controller will ensure that the remaining runway length is sufficient for takeoff. No, not their job. D, noise abatement procedures have been canceled. No, that has nothing to do with this question, so that's not correct. So a very similar question. A pilot required requests an intersection takeoff from ATC. If authorized, well, let's look at A, the controller will always give the run remaining runway length. Uh, they should, but it's not the most correct answer. B, the controller will ensure that remaining runway length is sufficient. No. C, it is the pilot's responsibility to ensure that the remaining runway length is sufficient for takeoff. That's the correct answer. D, noise abatement procedures are canceled. No, that's not right. Here's another common sense question, which of course we haven't gone over, but just try to think to yourself how, what you would do if you went flying and this happened. When instructed to continue an approach to a runway which is clear of traffic, what action should the pilot take if no landing clearance is received? A, circle 360 to the left. B, circle 360 in the direction of the circuit. C, complete the landing. Or D, request the landing clearance. Well, hopefully your common sense is clicking in. Well, simple, you just request a landing clearance. A pilot on final approach is requested by ATC to reduce airspeed. The pilot should A, comply giving due consideration to minimum maneuvering speed of the aircraft. That sounds pretty good. Let's continue reading. B, acknowledge a transmission and execute a 360 degree turn. No, of course not. That just sounds silly. They asked me to slow down, not do a 360. C, overshoot and rejoin the circuit. No, uh, why you would do that, that would be silly. D, reduce airspeed well below normal approach speed range. So that's dangerous. So B, C, and D are all really stupid. And I'm hoping that you got this answer right. It is A, you comply with ATC, giving due consideration to safe minimum maneuvering speed. However, if ATC gave you um, a speed that you could not comply with, well, you would just tell ATC you cannot comply because that's too slow. But it's rare that that will happen. Here's another common sense question. Pilot is cleared to land, but is concerned about the high crosswind component. The pilot should A, use full flaps and reduce approach at a reduced airspeed. Uh, so from your flying lessons, you will learn, no, that's not correct. You use actually less flaps, not more flaps. B, alter heading and land on another runway, which is more into wind. That's reasonable but let's continue c overshoot and request an into wind runway so i think that one actually is more correct uh, because you might not be able to just simply alter heading and go on another runway and you might have to talk to air traffic control d continue the approach and land as the clearance must be obeyed so hopefully you know that no you do not need to obey a clearance if it is unsafe so correct answer c overshoot and request an into wind runway or if you chose B, you were wrong, but you're on the right track. A pilot on a VFR flight is being vectored by ATC towards an extensive unbroken layer of cloud. The responsibility for remaining VFR rests with A, the radar operator. Uh, no, I'm not, I'm not even sure what that position is. I, I, I've never heard of a radar operator since like the Second World War. B, ATC since the flight is designated VFR. No, remember it's ATC has no responsibility to you. It's all your responsibility. ATC, since the cloud is visible on radar, no. D, the pilot, that is correct. You should know this from uh, our first lesson. A student pilot on VFR flight has been given a radar vector by ATC. Ahead at a lower altitude is a solid overclass cloud condition. The pilot should A, climb above the cloud and fly VFR over the top, no, absolutely not. A student pilot is not allowed to fly VFR over the top. B, alter heading is necessary to remain VFR and advise ATC. That sounds like a pretty good answer. Let's continue reading. C, maintain heading and altitude as it is an ATC clearance. Uh, no, that would make the pilot break a rule and be unsafe. So no, you don't follow the ATC clearance. D, maintain heading and altitude because ATC knows of the cloud and will issue further instructions. No, certainly they do not know of the cloud. You know of the cloud. So the most correct answer in this case, B, alter heading 
remain VFR, and advise air traffic control. An aircraft on a special VFR flight has been cleared for a straight-in approach. Because of low ceiling and poor visibility, the pilot is concerned about the exact location of a radio mast in the vicinity. So that's a radio tower. Avoiding this obstruction is the responsibility. Remember, who's responsible for everything? Ah, it's the pilot, A. The pilot on a special VFR flight has been cleared to the circuit. Ahead at a lower altitude, it's a solid layer of stratus cloud. Remaining clear of cloud is the responsibility of. Well, remember, everything is the responsibility of the pilot. So power controller, no. ATC, no. The pilot and ATC, no. D, the pilot is the correct answer. The pilot is responsible for everything. Hopefully by now the concept that the pilot is responsible for everything has been solidly drilled into your brain. Let's have a look at the next question. The holder of a student pilot permit made for the per sole purpose of the holder's own flight training act as PIC of an aircraft. A, only when accompanied by a flight instructor. So that's not correct because you can go solo with a student pilot permit. B, by day and night. No, because a student pilot cannot fly at night. C, by day only. Now that's correct. D, while carrying passengers. Note, you're explicitly forbidden from carrying passengers with a student pilot permit. Correct answer, C, by day only. I think I've seen this question before on another one of the lessons that I did. So my apologies if you've seen it before already. The PIC of an aircraft shall comply with any light signals or ground signals prescribed in the cars. A, only while in Class C airspace if they're part of an ATC clearance. Nope. Only while in a control zone if they're part of an ATC clearance. Nope. C, at all times. D, at all times provided safety is not jeopardized. Correct answer, D, you have to comply with light signals, but you have to ensure that safety is not jeopardized. Here's another common sense question, which I did not give you the exact answer in uh, this lesson. Before setting out on any VFR flight, a pilot is required to A, read all weather reports received from stations within 100 miles of destination. Uh, no, that seems a bit onerous. B, file a flight itinerary. No, you don't need to fly a flight itinerary. You could file a flight plan or you could just uh, stay within 25 miles. C, be familiar with all available information. That sounds pretty good. Let's continue. D, obtain an ATC clearance. No, you don't need an ATC clearance if you're not in controlled airspace. So correct answer C. You have to be available with all, be familiar with all available information. I think we've covered this in this lesson. Turbulence is a risk in the mountains, in the vicinity of thunderstorms, in the winter. D, A and B are correct. Well, we know it's the mountains, we know it's thunderstorms. A and B are correct. Pilot lands during a very heavy rain he is most likely to encounter A, dynamic hydroplaning, B, viscous hydroplaning, C, static hydroplaning, D, reverted rubber hydroplaning. So remember when we said heavy rain, we can assume that there's a thick layer of water on the runway, I think. And so the thick layer of water, that's associated with dynamic hydroplaning that creates kind of a wave ahead of the wheel. Viscous hydroplaning is when there's not much water and reverted rubber hydroplaning occurs when steam is created. So the correct answer is A, dynamic hydroplaning. Last question, in northern domestic airspace, runway 22 would have a heading of A, 22 degrees true, B, 220 degrees true, C, 22 degrees magnetic, or D, 220 degrees magnetic. Remember, northern domestic airspace is true. Runway 22, they took the zero off, so that's going to be B, 220 degrees true. That concludes uh, this lesson on flight operations. Hopefully you found that the information that we covered is relevant and you learned something from it. We'll see you on our next lesson of flight operations.